So first, a couple of announcements. Homework four is available. It's two questions, one on virtual and physical addresses. So I guess I should you know, actually share it with the class here. I'll send to all. Does this work? OK, whatever. We'll go with this for now. Uh, anyway, virtual and physical addresses on the first one. And then for the second question, it, it's a bunch of TLB stuff. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about it right now, except for that it's available. And then also, Project three starter code and description are available. Fair warning. Um, I I might so the description itself is is set in stone uh, effectively, um, but I won't. I I haven't provided very many test cases yet, so there will probably be some a few more incoming later on and also the greater script like currently every test that passes is just a point that'll probably change for the final um grading of it but the the rubric is set it's just the per test um uh points may change and I'm fairly certain that I that that all of my expected answers are correct, but I'm not going to put it beyond myself to have messed that up. Um, so if you find something that seems off, let me know. Don't uh, and then we'll, we'll look and see if it is off or not. Um, and I'm I'm having Adam go over it. But he hasn't gotten around to it yet, so it'll you know we'll we'll get to it. Um, uh, within maybe a week or so, um, but I wanted to give it to you anyway, so you can see it started on it, and uh, even if maybe I've you know maybe one or two things is slightly off. Okay, any questions on that? We'll talk a little bit more at the end about the actual project, but. I want to get into the actual content, which we're behind on because they decided to lock us out. So we ended last time we were talking about this DRAM subsystem. And these, if you recall, are our is our hierarchy. We have the channel at the top. Then channels are composed of one or more DIMMs. Each of our modules are composed of one or more ranks. Ranks have uh, some number of chips on them, and then each chip has some number of banks. And then the banks are where we have the rows and columns of data. Um, so we went over that last time. So now we're going to get into scheduling. Um, and this is where we kind of stopped last time uh, with our row buffer. If you remember from our um, previous slides, we um, pull all of the data from an entire row into a row buffer. And then we use the column muxer to kind of determine which column to pull out of. The this row buffer has two different policies that we can use. We can either, after accessing, send that row back into the bank and just put it back up where it was, or we can leave it in the row buffer. And the benefits of, of each are similar to like if we had a, a cache, right, that we, as soon as we access, we, we would write back or you know, put it back up into a higher level of cache. Um, 
it's kind of analogous. So for example, with open row, we leave the row open, we leave it in the row buffer. This helps if we have locality. If we have to access the same row again, we get a row hit and we get no penalty as far as having to pull anything into the row buffer or getting rid of anything from the row buffer. All we have to do is move the data from the row buffer to the pins and out over to the CPU. The con is obviously that we can have row conflicts. Closed row policy is the opposite, where we close the row after we access and we get rid of conflicts because there's never anything in the row um, on, on the next access. But we lose the benefit of being able to take advantage of locality. So let's look at uh, an example where we have two um, diff the two different policies, open and closed. And then we have a sequence of requests and their time of arrival. So this is their time in, in uh, uh, nanoseconds. So X and Y, uh, X arrives at time zero, Y arrives at time 10. Then X plus one is just uh, the same memory uh, is gonna be to the same row, but a different column. So this is um, what it means when it says X plus one. So that request arrives at time 100, for example. Now, we're also provided a few other details, namely that uh, it takes 20 nanoseconds if we get a row buffer hit to move the data from the row buffer into the pin. If we have an empty row buffer access, then we have to read the row in, and then we have to move the data from the row buffer down to the pin, and that's gonna take 40 milliseconds, so twice as long. If we have a row buffer conflict, then we have to pre-charge the bit lines, which means put the row back where it was, then read the new row, and then move the data from the row buffer down to the pin, and that's gonna take 60 nanoseconds. Okay, so um, any questions on this example before we, I give you a minute or so to, to work on it. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's get rid of that. This. We've changed it. I'm really confused now. All right. So, uh, how long it, for, for this first one? 
this where we, where we receive x as a request at time zero. When is that going to be serviced in? Oh, sorry, there's a question here in the chat. What are the pins again? Basically, the pins are the actual contacts, uh, electrical contacts uh, with the, basically with the motherboard that'll uh, move the data from the RAM SIC over to our uh, CPU. So, in in the open policy, what are what is our uh, what is our time of service going to be for this first request? Any ideas? So let's go back over to our slides real quick and see uh, which case is this? Is it an empty row? Is it a row buffer hit or a conflict? 40 nanoseconds. Yeah, so it's, it's gonna be the second one. It's an empty row buffer access. Um, so we're at 40, okay. What about for closed? Again, which case is it? Uh, 100? Um, it can be done at 40, yeah. So, so this one's also gonna be 40. So, um, we're, what we're doing is we're comparing between these two different um, policies, open policy and closed policy, kind of seeing when they would be uh, serviced. Now, where we'll see, start to see some divergence is on the second one. So for Y, this is a new row. So we're gonna have a row conflict if we have the open policy, but for the closed policy, we're not gonna have any any conflict here shoot sorry i should move back here so for this open policy when is y going to be able to be serviced it arrives at time 10 but we can't service it until after after this one's done so we can't we can't really do any, we can start it af after this, but what is the time when it will be done? Yeah, so this one's the one where it's 100. Yeah, so it's this 40 plus in the 60 time. So let's look at the closed one then. This is where we close our row after we access. So then we never have a any conflicts. So let's just see here. When is this one going to be serviced? Yeah, 100. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, not 100. This one's going to be serviced at uh, 80, right? No. Well, let's go back over here. Uh, so 40 on, so it'll be done at 80, yes. I can't do math, guys, sorry. Yep, sorry, I was just 
I messed up my uh, my mathematics. So don't 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 look too hard. Okay. So now let's look at x plus one. When can this be serviced in the open policy? Well, it's gonna be a conflict, right? So this will be 60 nanoseconds after. Uh, in this case, we the request and the uh, the, the request arrived and the, the, the previous memory access finished at the same time. So it'll just be uh, 160 here. And then over here on the closed policy, we're going to see a little bit different, right? This is again only going to be this uh, empty row buffer access fit. So we're only going to see 40 nanoseconds after this 100. So it, it's critical that we don't say like 120 here, because that would be wrong. We don't have the request yet. So we have to base it off of this 100. Um, and then we we look at X plus two as our next memory uh, request. This comes in at time 200. So when can we service that in the open policy? 220, 20 nanoseconds after we receive it. Why? Well, it's because we get a real buffer hit. So it's gonna take us this 20 nanoseconds. Okay. What about the closed policy? Two forty. So here we see a situation where the closed policy isn't as good, right? Oh, up here uh, in the first two, the closed policy was actually better because um, there were two different rows being accessed. So it was advantageous to uh, go ahead and uh, get rid of that row once we had used it. However, down here, since we have two of the same in, in a row, uh, the, 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 the closed policy is worse. So then we look at our second to last access here. That's y plus one at time 250. And when can we service this in the open policy? At 310. Yeah, so. Why? Well, it's again back to our list over here. This is a row buffer conflict. It's a different row. Uh, it's going to take a 60 nanoseconds. Um, and since we aren't servicing anything at the at the uh, at that time when the request comes in, it'll take us exactly six nanoseconds from the request arrival. Let's look at the closed policy though. When will we be able to service that one? Two ninety. Yep. So forty nanoseconds after. Now we go back to X plus three. Um, when do we? Are we able to service this one? Three seventy. Yeah. So the limiting factor is this request above that ends at three ten. Uh, so it'll take sixty nanoseconds after that to be able to service this different row. However, in the um, closed policy. When are we going to be able to service? Three forty, right? Yeah. So again, this is going back to our our list over here. 
Um, in the closed policy, that's just going to be a 40 nanosecond access time uh, for all of these conflicts. Um, however, if we are using the open policy, conflicts are going to be expensive and we're going to get this uh, uh, additional hit. Okay. Any questions on that? So this kind of suggests that we um, don't like conflicts, right? These conflicts are pretty extensive if we have an open policy. And even if it's a closed policy, you know, it's still annoying. Um, generally, we would want, we, would, we want to use the open policy, though, um, over the closed policy, just because we do often have locality. But it doesn't do us any good if, we just keep alternating between different rows and having to evict. So what if we kind of were able to rearrange these memory accesses? So maybe all of the X's happened at once. We got a bunch of row hits. Um, it takes 20 nanoseconds on all of them. And then we do all of the Y's. And then it'll take, you know, it'll take 60 nanoseconds for the first one, but then it'll take 20 seconds, 20 nanoseconds, 20 seconds would be really bad. 20 nanoseconds to do the second one and any subsequent Y axis. So that's an idea. Um, we're going to see that's not easy, though, um, for a variety of reasons. Now, um, the reason that we're able to do stuff like this, where we kind of schedule our memory accesses, is this this component called the memory controller, which um, arbitrates between a bunch of different request streams. So you might have your CPU that's requesting some data, other CPU that's requesting some data. Maybe there's some IO that's requesting data. Um, this could be, for example, if your network card was requesting data. That's not necessarily going through your CPU. That's just going straight to the memory controller. Um, so we have this arbiter, which kind of schedules our transactions. Um, we do a bunch of address translation. You know, this is where a lot of that stuff happens. Um, and then we actually have our our queues for different banks, um, where we have a bunch of um, requests, oh, oops, queued up for various different banks, and we can kind of schedule uh, those accordingly. You know, and we can do do these scheduling in a way that you know helps uh, with maybe keeping our rows open or doing something like that, uh, avoiding bank conflicts uh, and stuff like that. And then we have our our signal interface, which goes over to our gem. Uh, and, and gives the command and receives the data or sends the data back. Okay, here's kind of another view of this. We have a bunch of requests coming in from uh, our processor. And then we have different buffers for our different banks. So this queue will be like, I want this data from bank zero. And then I, I would want maybe this other data from bank uh, B minus one. And then each one has its own scheduler. And then we have a whole bus scheduler, which schedules which commands we send across the memory bus to the DRAM. Um, and uh, you know this has to figure out which of these banks takes priority, for example. All right, so let's just talk about a couple of different policies that we could use. Probably the one that would make the most sense just off the top of your head would be first come, first serve. It's classic queue uh, where, we, where we service whichever one came in first. That's pretty reasonable as far as that goes, but 
you know, it has the disadvantage of, for example, alternating between a bunch of different rows for uh, on, a, on a given bank, that would be suboptimal for uh, in this example. We also can do, because of this, something called first ready, first come, first serve. So what this will do is it'll be uh, favoring to row hit. So if a request comes in and it would be a row hit if we sent it over across the bus to our DRAM, we'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we'll just do the oldest first. So that seems pretty reasonable. What would happen above? Well, we would get X, you know, ass assuming that we had all of these kind of coming in at closer to the same time into our queues. We might do X and then X plus one. Maybe then at this point, you know, we would have time to go over and do Y, Y plus one, you know, X plus two, X plus three, something along these lines. Um, and kind of uh, service the ones that are going to give us um, these row buffer hits, which will maximize the, the DRAM row buffer utiliz utilization, which is a good thing. Now, there's, a pr there's some problems with this. One of them is the fact that there are many different cores that are going to be requesting data. Um, this is a trend that we continue to see, and I've highlighted many a time. Uh, computers are getting more and more cores. Even like phones these days are like, eight core or something ridiculous. Uh, so as we gain more cores, we have more streams of data that we need, more, diff uh, more totally disparate um, working sets for each of these different threads. And ideally, if we go ahead and go from say, two cores to four cores, we would get a two times speed up. But uh, that's, that's not really what we see. So uh, ideally, you know, if we have n, uh, ideally, as we see with Amdahl's law, our max, we would get our maximum parallel speed up. But as, I, as we've looked at that quite extensively, that's never the case. What we actually get oftentimes is something even worse than uh, um, even like just straight lining. We 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 see stuff. Um, we see situations where our performance degrades beyond what we would expect. Here's an example. Um, we have two different programs, MATLAB and GCC, running on two different cores. Um, GCC has high priority in the operating system for memory requ requests, and MATLAB has low priority. But yet, the slowdown, which is the inverse of our speed up, so higher is bad, the slowdown for our high priority uh, uh, program is way higher than the slowdown for our low priority program. Which is weird, right? You would think, okay, well, GCC should be have the highest priority on the CPU. It should have highest priority as far as you know getting its its uh, its memory done, but it's it's not. And the reason is it's this controller thing. You know, it may the, the, the CPU, the cores, the OS might be like, yeah, we should prioritize it and give it a lot of time, give it a, you know, all of its resources and everything. But the DRAM memory controller can come in, swoop in and be like, nope, let's actually change this, change kind of the ordering of our memory accesses um, in a way that, that actually is that advantageous to 
the other one, this low priority MATLAB. So let me actually, actually just real quick, and go over to a cool animation because, oh, no, I don't want that. Are you, yes, I'm sure. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay, so the, the difference between these two is that MATLAB primarily is dealing with vectors and, and matrices, which means that they're fairly uh, continuous um, stream of of requests like our requests are, are kind of you know i i plus one i plus two whereas gcc is kind of all over the place right it, it kind of needs that because of the nature of what it's doing it's constructing a tree it's traversing a tree it's then you know doing optimizations on a tree like those are all operations that are not very um uh memory like continuous for example so we have our, our, here, let me go back here. We basically have one program, which is stream, which is a stream of data, sequential data, and then one program which is doing random accesses. And if they both send requests to our, the memory controller at the same time, and let's just say that the, the stream one, the MATLAB one goes in first, now what's happened? Well, all of our banks are, ready to service uh, requests to a certain row. And since the MATLAB is going to request that same row again, because we're just going iterating through a vector or something, when it sends another request to the memory controller, what will happen? Well, the memory controller, if, if we're just favoring this open row policy, will go ahead and send that request from MATLAB, from the streaming program, over to our RAM. And then this process will continue. We'll get all of our requests um, coming down from MATLAB. And at the memory controller level, they'll be scheduled into our RAM at every step of the way, because we're favoring, again, we're, we're still favoring this uh, open row uh, already this uh, with this open row policy we're al already we're always favoring uh, situations that will give us a row hit so eventually though you know we'll get we'll get to a point where it would be a row miss and at that point then maybe maybe we would be able to service um, the gcc request but Already, you can see there's some unfairness here. We've serviced way more requests than we should have uh, from MATLAB um, and way fewer from GCC. OK. Any questions? So let's look and see what this stream concept means in practice. This is uh, a bunch of sequential accesses where we're doing index um, uh, and we're, we're just incrementing it by the size of kind of a cache line. And you can see that we're getting very high buffer locality. Why? Well, again, it's because we're accessing just the next bit of data in each row. So that's going to give us really good, good locality. And this is super memory intensive as well. Like uh, uh, most of the operations here are memory or getting prepared to do a memory operation. Okay. On the other hand, um, we have GCC, which isn't quite this random, but it's, you know, it's kind of similar. 
Um, you know, it is it is running around and accessing stuff probably on the heap. Anyway, we basically have a random index and we're indexing into to some array, whether that's an actual array or some heap or something like that, it doesn't really matter, but it's effectively random. And we're gonna get very low uh, buffer um, locality. It's also though memory intensive, right? Almost every single operation here is memory or preparing for memory. The problem is that one of them is streaming, one of them is going to be able to take advantage of that uh, row buffer locality, the other one is not. And that's where the unfairness comes in uh, and causes some problems. Okay. So what does this actually look like in practice? So here's our request buffer on the left. Here's our banks on, uh, here's just one bank on the, on the right here. And then this is our kind of um, uh, T0 is, is the streaming program. T1 is the random one. So when our request comes in for from T0 for row zero, then we're gonna get a row hit in the buffer. We're gonna get that data, great. Then say we get a couple more requests in from one from T1 that goes to row 16 and one from T0 that goes back to row zero. Which one do we choose? If we're going with this prefer open rows policy, we're gonna go ahead and use that T0 one pull that back down uh, and, and this one will continue uh, servicing that. Maybe it's a different column now, maybe it's uh, column one, but we're still gonna use this, uh, uh, this row zero from T zero, even though it's, it's maybe not higher priority on the CPU. So we get a few more requests in, again, we get this row zero, we notice that that will be a row buffer hit and we service it. And we keep doing this over and over and over again, uh, even though all the requests for T1, which is technically higher priority, are piling up, but they're not to the same row. And we're just gonna go ahead and keep servicing the ones that are to the same row. And there's a lot more for this animation. You can see we're, we're basically accessing our entire row buffer um, before we start to service T1 at all. So if our row size is, for example, eight kilobytes and our uh, cache block size is 64 bytes, that's gonna be 128 requests that get serviced um, for T0 before we even service one for T1. If we're using this, prefer open row buffer uh, policy. Okay. So you have this animation too, but it doesn't look as pretty without the, you know, PowerPoint. Any questions? So this has an effect on memory performance. Um, generally, we see a slight slowdown from the streaming one between uh, if it was just running alone versus running in tandem with this random um, uh, program. But the slowdown that we see in the random case is just off the chart. It's really bad. So since main memory is a shared resource, we, we have a bunch of problems with these unfair uh, slowdowns across threads, across cores. Uh, this is not a good situation. Um, 
obviously the ones that are that are getting the best performance are the hogs. This one's hogging up all the resources. Maybe it's really sequential acts, a lot of sequential accesses. So this one is just going to have great performance and it's going to really hurt other ones uh, like this one over here. And we're, because this memory controller, you know, is kind of independent of, of the cores, even if our OS is prioritizing this this one over here as the highest priority process that that doesn't mean that the memory controller is also equally prioritizing it so again you might have a situation where uh, low priority processes will still get high priority in the memory controller okay Any questions on this? And then we'll move on to a, one solution that we could apply. Okay, so one option to kind of alleviate this is this stall time fair memory scheduling. The goal is that the all of the processes that are running at the same time should experience similar slowdowns uh, as compared to when they run alone so effectively we're we're distributing the slowdown across all of our different processes and this helps us be more fair in our scheduling Effectively, what this is going to do is, is if we get a little bit too far ahead, we get too fast on one of our processes, and it's getting a bunch of memory accesses services serviced, well, another process is getting starved and, and is, you know, not able to service their request. What it'll do is it'll, it'll be like, okay, we'll give you a chance to catch up a little bit, even though it's slightly suboptimal um, on the DRAM side of things. So there's a question here. So does this issue have anything to do with the priority or just that the higher priority processes happen to have random memory access to? Uh, this is mainly just showing that um, the prior the CPU priority, the OS priority of a process doesn't have an effect on uh, main memory or the memory controller. So you know, if, for example, our high priority uh, process was also happened to be a sequential uh, non random memory access program, then it would also experience, um, a, 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 you know, something like along these lines with a with, with a uh, fairly small slowdown. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, it's more just showing that, you know, the priority can help, but it's not going to help on the memory controller side of things, which is unfortunate. So the idea is let's make a memory controller that estimates each thread slowdown and when we need to schedule let's schedule in a way that balances these slowdowns across all of the different threads okay we have to first talk about a few definitions before we look and see how this would actually work the first definite kind of definition is that a dram system is fair if it equalizes the slowdown of equal priority threads relative to when each thread is run alone on the same system. Okay, so what does this mean in practice? We have thread A, thread B, both have priority one in our OS. Um, our DRAM system would be fair if 
the slowdown that each of them experiences is relatively equal. So if they're both experiencing a 1.5 times slowdown, then that's, that's equitable. If one is experiencing maybe a 1.2 slowdown and the other one's experiencing a seven times slowdown, that would be inequitable. Now, the DRAM related stall time, this is the time that a thread spends waiting for DRAM memory. This is basically it's, it's kind of queue time, if you will. How long has it been waiting around for, for service? So a couple more definitions. Uh, stall time shared. So this is DRAM related stall time when the thread runs with other threads. So this is basically how long are we waiting for memory when we're being run in parallel with some other threads doing memory ad accesses as well. ST alone is the stall time when the thread is run uh, without other threads. And I definitely made a typo here. So when we're alone, when we're the only process on the system, what is our time to wait for all of our memory? Memory slowdown then can be compared by comparing our, uh, our shared and alone slow, uh, uh, stall times. And this gives us a relative increase in stall time from if the process was being run alone versus the process being run uh, concurrently with other processes on different cores. And what the stall time fair, uh, fair memory schedule aims to do is equalize the memory slowdown for these interfering threads. Um, and ideally we do this without sacrificing performance. What we'll do is we'll consider uh, kind of the uh, baseline performance that we would see from our each thread. And then we'll try and equalize the slowdown across all of our different threads that are interfering with one another. Uh, any questions on this concept? And we'll talk about how it actually, how we can actually implement. Cool. So for each thread, our DRAM controller now has to be really fancy. It has to do some more things. It has to keep track of ST shares. Again, that's this guy up here. How long is each thread waiting for memory? And it's going to estimate ST alone. It, it doesn't have an A-B testing ability. So we're going to at least just try and estimate it. On each IO cycle, the DRAM controller is then going to um, calculate the slowdown for all of the threads with legal requests. So if your thread has made a request to the controller and that request hasn't been serviced yet, it'll be counted in this computation, we'll compute a memory slowdown. Again, that memory slowdown is computed via these two values. And once we've calculated the slowdown for all of the threads that have active, active and legal requests, we'll compute unfairness, which is just the ratio between the max number, uh, uh, the max of all of our slowdowns and the minimum of all of our slowdowns numbers. So if we have two threads, one of which has a slowdown of now it's 10 um, and our min slowdown is one, that would be a really, really bad situation. Um, our unfairness would be 10. Okay, so 10 is kind of big. What we then do is we check against some alpha, some number uh, that, we, that we deem as our kind of unfairness threshold. 
it doesn't really matter what it is, but we'll just we'll just call it alpha. And if then unfairness is less than that, then we just keep going with our original uh, DRAM throughput oriented scheduling policy, uh, meaning that we we go ahead and prioritize row buffer hits. But once our unfairness goes above this uh, threshold, we're going to switch to a fairness oriented policy, which is going to be that we do requests from the um, most affected uh, thread first. And then we'll go ahead and do our row hits first, and then our oldest first scheduling policy. What this what this does is that it you know it will it'll, it will make sure that no thread ever gets too far ahead of the other thread. I'll show this real quick, and then we'll we'll talk about the project. So how does this help? We're going to look see the same sequence of instructions coming into our uh, queue, except for this time. Now we have a notion of slowdown and unfairness, and we're going to set alpha to 1.05. So this allows us to go a little bit ahead on one thread, but then we'll have to catch up with the other threads before, uh, before we are able to go and continue on with the memory hog. What if the thread, threads don't use the same memory and they use parallel memory? Uh, so the, for, that, that's a great question. If, for example, these threads are both going to two different channels, yeah, that's fine. They can go off on on their uh, channels independently, and they won't interfere with one another. But if we have a situation where they're running, uh, they they require the same channel, they're going to the same dim, but a different uh, row in each in the bank, then that's going to be the case where we where we observe observe this problem. But yes, there are other ways besides doing this slowdown stuff to to kind of help this problem. But you know, these days everyone's running like a hundred threads on their computer at least. So you're you're going to have some situations where a few things are mapped to the same row, and you want to not you want to be able to avoid uh, situations like that. That was a great question, though. Any other questions? Okay, so we get T0 as a request. We go ahead, service that because it's the only one to service. Then uh, this T1 and T0 requests come in to our buffer. And we go ahead and choose T0. Uh, we go ahead and do that because we're using that throughput optimizing scheduler, which optimizes for row buffer hit. And T0 on row zero would be a row buffer hit. So we go ahead and service it. But what happens is that we, we also update our slowdown. So now T1 has a bit of slowdown, right? It's a little bit slower than if it had been running alone, right? If it, if it had been running alone, this would have been serviced and it would be slowdown of one, nothing happened. But since we decided to service T0 instead, we get a little bit of unfairness now. Then we go ahead and bring in another request to uh, row zero from T0. We'll go ahead and service it. Why? Well, it's because our unfairness, which is 1.03, is not above our alpha yet. So we go ahead and service that T0 request. But now unfairness is above our threshold. So when we have a few more requests coming in, what will we do? Well, well unfairness is high. 
So we're going to prioritize whichever one has the max slowdown. In this case, it's T1. So we'll service T1. We'll go ahead and um, service this request from T1 to row 16. This is going to require us to change what's in the row buffer. So we're going to incur a conflict on the row buffer. But at least we're going to make some progress on T1. Now, our, our uh, slowdown on T0 is going to go up a bit. Because if it were running alone, it would have gotten to be able to serve, it would have been serviced at that time. Um, but now we incurred a little bit of penalty, uh, a little bit of slowdown because we had to service the other thread. But because we slowed that one down a little bit, now it's kind of caught up in the slowness, if you will. And our unfairness has gone down, back down to 1.03. So we're going to uh, be able to uh, just continue servicing um, other requests. In this case, uh, T0 was the, the oldest request, so we'll just go ahead and service it. There's no robot for hit ability in any of these requests. So we'll just service whichever one was there first. This one's going to be to, to row zero. And oh, and we, we, we did have to increase our, um, our slowdown just a bit for T1. But our unfairness is, in, is still below our threshold. And we'll go ahead and service T0 again. But now our unfairness is going to go up uh, above our threshold because we've neglected this request to T1 for too long. And we'll go ahead and service that when the time comes. That'll put our slowdown below uh, the threshold and we'll continue doing this. We'll go back over to row zero. Um, this will be, oh. And then let's see, sorry, the animation is a little bit wonky. Row zero. Uh, anyway, I think that, that must be the end of the animation. OK. So what did we see? What we saw here is that um, each thread is making progress, which is way better than what it was on the previous animation, where we saw that only T0 was making progress. T1 got starved for an entire 128 requests. And then it finally got it to do one of its requests. So um, that is what this uh, um, uh, this more complicated policy will give us. Any questions as I pull up the project? Actually, let's just look at it here. So project three is a branch simulation or branch prediction simulator. You're going to implement uh, seven different branch predictors. So the first branch predictor is that you'll implement is this just always not taken. Branch predictor, you'll also predict, do an always taken predictor. So these are pretty easy. You just always return taken or always return not taken. Um, backwards taken, forward not taken. We talked about this in class as well, where we always take a backward branch and we never take a forward branch. These first three are all static branch prediction strategies. Um, and then the next four are dynamic ones. So these ones are being updated as we go at runtime. So our last time global branch predictor, this is going to be our one bit uh, branch predictor and we're gonna have a global history register. We're gonna have to keep track of the 
uh, history using this and then use that to index into the uh, pattern history table to figure out which direction we predict the branch will go. Last time, local. This is where we have, we, where we use our program counters, which is effectively just the branch instruction address to index into our uh, local history register table. That then informs which table, which pattern history table we should use. And to be clear, um, there is down here, I, I mentioned that each local history register has its own pattern history table. So there are 16 local history registers. Each local history register stores four bits of history, which is going to be 16 different um, entries in the pattern history table. So we're going to have 16 times 16 pattern history table entries, but um, each LHR only corresponds to one of those six block of 16. You can implement, so in processors, it can be implemented either way. Um, we can either implement it as we have a local, uh, local history register that indexes into a pattern history table and each one indexes into the same pattern history table, or they can have separate ones. Either one is seen in the wild. We're choosing the one where each local history register has its own pattern history table. Um, I've also just specified as constants the size of our pattern history tables and uh, the, the amount of history that we're storing. So there's no variance in that. It's just easier that way. It's already, you know, to me, it's not like that. Uh, insightful to have you guys implement things, uh, variable size LHRs and PHTs and stuff like that. That just doesn't make much sense since the, the goal of this is to have you understand these different predictors and understand how uh, they behave. Oh, also the branch target buffer is infinite. So we're always gonna know where our target is. So that, that helps with this um, backwards taken, forward not taken predictor. You never have to worry about, ooh, is it in the branch uh, uh, target uh, buffer? Yes, it is. It's always in there. And we're actually going to just go ahead and precede our branch target buffer. So we always know 100% of the time where our branch will go. That'll just make it easy. There's some descriptions of the actual branch predictors down here. Um, and uh, I, I also describe the uh, uh, what, how each branch has to be processed. But I want to just show you real quickly the input format. Um, the idea is that we have, I should have done that earlier, shouldn't I? Uh, we have two sections. The first section is the, the branch metadata. So this is telling us, there's a branch instruction at this address and it goes to here. So that's the target. We have another branch that is at this address and it goes to this target, et cetera. And then down below we have the instructions and whether or not they're taken or not taken. So this is basically a trace, very similar to the memory traces that you've seen on the previous projects. But now this is just branch prediction traces where we have a branch and then whether or not it was taken. Now, obviously, if you were a real processor, you wouldn't know this at the same time. You'd have to find that out later. But since we're a simulation, we're gonna put them together. We'll only use this to determine our prediction, but we'll use this to update the necessary tables. Um, Let me just really quickly show you. So, so really the only file that you have to edit, I think, I, I don't think you should have to edit anything else, is uh, the branch predictors.c. 
And it's organized very similarly to like the replacement policies and, and such where um, we have constructors for each different type of branch predictor. This one's for the always not taken version. And again, it's just a bunch of function pointers which go to these three um, functions that define the functionality of our um, branch predictor. So for example, here's, here you go. Here's five free points. You can just, for this always not taken, return not taken. Um, I've defined an enum to help you out uh, with the branch direction, so just so it's, you know, you don't have to keep track of zero and one or something like that. Um, and yeah, that's there's your solution. There's five five, five free points. Um, so I'll you guys are dismissed. Uh, I'll stick around for a couple questions. I see some in chat that I will answer right now. So it, so this code for P three is independent from P one and P two. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, entirely new code that hopefully doesn't have any bugs in it. Yeah, any other questions? Oh, sorry, Say, give me a second. I just spilled my water. Let me turn you up as well. Can you say that again? Your audio isn't coming through very clear for me. Um, yeah, sorry. Let me. Can you hear me better? Oh, yeah, it's so much better. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so what's the motivation for going back to the stream in that simulate in that example you were showing? Um, so every time yeah. we would get back to below alpha, we would go back to the row zero access. Oh, yeah, great question. So the reason is it goes back to here. So we, um, we, we, when unfairness it goes down um, below alpha, we go back to our old uh, scheduling policy. And let me just go find that slide where it talks about it. The old scheduling policy. Where to go? Optimizes for row hit first, but then it just does oldest first. Okay. And if we go down to the example, Okay, so, so we service row 16. Now unfairness is down below zero. What we'll do is we'll look and see, is there a possibility of having a row buffer hit in any of these requests? Well, no, none of these are row 16. So we're gonna just go with the oldest first. And okay. this T0, oh shoot, on it. Uh, T0 came in, this T0 request, to row zero came in before the uh, T1 request. Okay. See? So that's yeah. why we're going to go ahead and service it. But if we had two red requests in a to row. row 16, for example, if we had two red requests to row 16, we would go, we would, we would do that one first. Or, or like even row 16, then row 111, and then row zero came in. So yeah, after yeah. We, we would do yeah. the row 111. Okay. Yeah. If, if for example, this. Uh, this T zero was after it was up here. Yeah. yeah. Th then we would do this T one first. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Any other questions? 